I'm going to talk about um, is the question um, Catherine's just read out, can and should participant public archaeology tackle social uh, disadvantage? Now, for a long time, this sort of argument about whether archaeology should be instrumentalised to achieve anything else than the best outcomes for the uh, tangible physical heritage um, was quite a, a, um, a loud one. Um, but I think we've moved on from that, really. I think we've, we've identified that, you know, um, the risks of um, people who haven't got years of experience of causing damage to archaeological heritage can be mitigated by effective project management and design. Um, but nonetheless, the evidence base, and this has been touched on already, um, for the benefits, the wider social benefits that archaeology involving uh, people outside the profession in archaeology, um, the evidence base for those benefits is still dominated by more affluent communities or people from more affluent communities. And at the same time, we've got spending cuts are, of course, severely affecting both uh, archaeology and social programmes. So can we actually uh, join this up um, by enabling good participative public archaeology to achieve wider social goals? And key to this really is having a good evidence base for what is achieved, what can be achieved and what has been achieved to make the argument. So I'm just going to run through a couple of case studies, really, um, from work that I've um, uh, developed in the last, uh, well, nearly 15 years now, I suppose. Um, uh, first is the um, Higher Education Field Academy. Um, this has been running, uh, well, it was started in 2005 um, and uh, was running up until this year, 2018. Um, some of you may have heard about this before, but the aim, um, and it was funded by the European, European Social Fund originally, um, uh, validated by Hefke, um, with AIM Higher when the um, previous Labour government had set up AIM Higher. Um, and the aim was to involve disadvantaged young people from families with no or very little experience of higher education in archaeological excavation in order to raise their aspirations, particularly academic aspirations, boost their personal self-esteem and their self-confidence and instill new transferable skills and knowledge to enable them to fulfil those aspirations. And that last bit was really important. It's relatively easy to send people away infused, leaving them more able to fulfil those raised aspirations and maintain that level of um, raised self-esteem is more of a challenge. Uh, the methodology was a very simple one, partly because it filled, ful fulfilled the research aims and partly because it meant we could offer the same potential experience to large numbers of people. It was one metre test pit excavations um, where we, would work, we were working with teenagers, 13, 14, 15 year olds, um, not the easiest group to work with and a group that's often overlooked actually in many school projects which will work with primary schools or sixth formers, there's a big gap in the middle. Um, so they would come, they would spend two days being briefed on how to do a test pit excavation, giving the set of equipment, divided into a mixed school group with people they didn't know before, provided with a map and told to go and get cracking. And then we'd come around and see how they were getting on um, and uh, help identify finds and talk about what they were finding. Um, and then on the third day, they would come into the university, learn a bit about the background of the project. They'd then write a report on their test pit excavation. Um, it's important to stress that they were carrying out meaningful research. The data um, that they were excavating was from inhabited rural settlements. Uh, we were looking to reconstruct how these places develop, places that are not accessible to most archaeological excavation because people are still living in them today. And the outcomes have been and are being published widely. And there's uh, just one example there um, of a paper on the Black Death, which was published in antiquity based entirely on evidence that young people from these projects had found doing these one metre squares. But what I want to talk about more is the, the impact it had on the young people. So we um, surveyed this through pre and post um, attitudinal questionnaires, asking them about their attitudes to staying on in school for sixth form, uh, for higher education, at university, uh, because this was running from Cambridge, whether they were considering Cambridge. So they were asked the same questions um, before and after um, so that we could get a balance of how their, their attitudes had changed. 
Um, so we could identify that after it, they were feeling more positive about staying in education after year 11. When we started this project, you could leave school at 16. You can't do that in England now, but the, so it was an important uh, hurdle to get over, if you like. So as you can see here, perhaps 79% of the students showed an increase in the interest and commitment they had to staying in school after sixth form. And equally, feeling more positive about going to university, 84%. I think sometimes it's easier to feel more positive about the distant possibility of going to university and then the slightly more immediate prospect of staying in school after 16. So the fact we managed to achieve both and perhaps slightly higher on university is reflected there. We also asked staff, the, so the schools would send uh, staff along to accompany the students because they're under 16. Uh, we'd ask them as well questions like that, like what did they feel the students had gained from the, um, from the field academy overall? Um, and then specifics, has their understanding of the subject grown? Uh, and again, these same questions about attitudes to staying in education. Oh, and the reference there is this is a, a paper that was published in Public Archaeology a few years ago. So all this data has gone through peer review. We also evaluated the skills they gained. It's very easy to say that people taking part in community archaeology or participative archaeology projects gain skills. Um, but we very rigorously identified what these skills were. We worked with Cambridge Assessment, who run the OCR exam board, um, to actually distill out precisely what those skills are, and then developed a method for assessing them using range descriptors, which would identify low-level behaviour, medium-level behaviour, and high-level behaviour, so that the assessors, and more to the point, really, the students themselves would know what excellence looked like so that they could aim for excellence in these various categories. And we had about 18, I think, separate categories. So you can see here, verbal communication broken down into two separate categories, one sort of explaining, presenting uh, what you're finding, and the other engaging in a discussion to come to an agreement in a respectful way. Very different verbal communication skills. Each of them have these three behaviours. And so these sheets, sheets with all this information were shared with the students. They would assess their skills on the first day and then again on the second day so they have the time to sort of work out how to raise their skills level if they wanted to and the staff as well were assessing them. So when again we published the outcomes of this on in these various categories we could see both the staff assessments and the students assessments you can see here in reflective learning and considering how effectively you've carried out a task 78% of students feel they've improved skills in that area. Almost 100% of them probably have become aware for the first time that this itself is a skill of and on, of and on itself, working with effort and persistence. Again, you can see that 86% felt that it had improved their skills in this area. We worked across the full skills range. Each of these, so you can see verbal communication, now you've already seen that has two subcategories as did all of the other various categories. Each of these was reported on. We have this overall data showing uh, the impact the participation has had on the students. And then because what was really important was that the students should be aware of the skills they have and also know how to communicate those skills to others when they're applying for jobs or university, uh, they would receive a letter at the end. And the, the letter would then be personalized with information about all of these various skills uh, information about why it's valuable, why those va skills are valuable for workplace and for learning, how those skills were deployed on the field academy, and then how they themselves had performed. And the language that was used was the sort of language that would be quite easily translated into a job application or a UCAS application or used to prepare for an interview. I mean, hopefully you can see that if you can read it at all. But we were very much concerned with raising the participants perception of what they were capable of what their skills were and what they had that was valuable that they could offer others and they had a belief as well in the authenticity of that because they understood how they'd used and developed those skills in an activity they knew they'd carried out um, the statistics of the higher education field academy it's run for 14 years uh, more than 130 separate field academies more than 7,000 students 91% rating it excellent or good, as you can see, 84% feel more positive about university, and more than 80% averaged across all those various skills feel it helped them develop those skills. 
Second case study I want to talk about is another disadvantaged community here, very much a community of place. Uh, the aim of the Unearthing Middlefields Utopia project was to involve residents of a 1960s social housing estate in archaeological excavations within that housing estate. There was no known archaeology there previously whatsoever. We weren't after an Arnage Hillfort or Roman villa. We wanted to explore the heritage of that estate. Um, and you can see the, the reasons for that to connect people their past, explore the impact on skills and aspirations using that same sort of framework that we developed with the students on a very uh, different, um, well, a community of place rather than a community of um, uh, sort of school. Um, we also wanted to extend understanding of the history of the estate and, and indeed to champion council housing in a period lacking good affordable rented housing. Uh, we carried this out in um, 2016. The whole uh, issue has, I think, become very much more um, politically visible since then, not, I would point out, because of what we did particularly. Um, this is the estate we worked on. Uh, the, um, we were focusing on these wide open greens. It's a particular form of planning, um, which was widely used in the 60s, replacing uh, previous sort of back-to-back -back slum housing. And these are both estates in the same place, Gainsborough in Lincolnshire. Um, again, it was meaningful research. We wanted to see what the excavations would tell us about the physical heritage, the tangible heritage of that estate. Because when these estates were built in the 1960s, there was no PPG 16. There was no work done uh, on these places. The outcomes are actually rather more spectacular than we expected. Um, some of you may, even if you're not experts in uh, post-medieval archaeology, you may re recognise some of the finds there. Um, but the significance was that we found these child-related finds in larger numbers on the areas which in the 1960s had been specifically designed as pedestrianised greens that houses would open onto to provide self-healthy spaces for children to play on. And I don't have time to go into this project in detail. I do have a sort of handout about this and I'll put these at the back um, if anyone wants one. Uh, on the other side there is an archaeological bingo card which I don't propose to play but it's one of the means we use to communicate the uh, results uh, to people which has been very successful. So I'm going to skip over really these wider significance points um, but I just want to make the point that actually this is telling us something new about the value of aspirational um, campaigns to build good affordable housing um, on a mass scale uh, which should act as an inspiration for the future rather than the rather condemnatory attitudes that have sometimes um, been brought to bear on this sort of planning and again I really don't have time to talk about this in detail because what I really want to talk about is the impact again on the community. This was a bottom-up project we worked with people on the estate from the very point at which we got the funding of my colleague at Lincoln who was brought up on this estate had already been carrying out research and had talked about ideas there. We use social media, the community in fact use social media, they suggested Facebook was the way to sort of build a community who were going to take part. You can see some of the posts there. Um, and Facebook again was used to sort of communicate the finds, uh, bring people together. And then we also carried out some post-project assessment. We didn't do pre and post in the same way because we didn't want to overburden it with something that made them feel like they were being experimented on. We were sort of concerned about that. So perhaps psychologists would have said pre and post would have been better. We felt this was less intrusive. Nonetheless, when we looked at the results, we could see again the rating was fantastic. We had probably 80 to 100 people on the community, sort of adult and family residents involved and 150 school children as well at the infant school. Um, we had answers from 22 test pit teams, each representing between four and 10 people. Um, you can see the overall rating is great. But it's also interesting, we started to look at what aspects did you enjoy? And people could just tick as many or as few of these as they wanted to. And what's really interesting is how something like learning to do something new and develop skills is coming out very high. This is a community that would conventionally be described as with high rates of unemployment and uh, yeah, teenage pregnancy and you know all sorts of kind of uh, less desirable social indicators. They're the sort of community that gets dismissed off and is not having aspirations, not being interested in self-improvement. We can see how this is coming out in this learning how to do something new. In the team working, being involved in a community activity, meeting people, again, coming out very highly, being ticked by lots of people. 
And we also asked how the activities affect their attitudes to heritage, uh, both on the estate and more generally, both immediately and in the future. And again, you can see on the data there, the, the bright green is the um, strongly agree, the turquoise blue is the agree. And you can see how positively these results are coming out. Now, there's an element of confirmation bias in that because we're asking them a sort of question which perhaps has a, an intimation that there's a kind of right answer of agree with this. Nonetheless, people could tick whatever they want. And the distinction between strongly and agree shows a sort of level of conscious choice making about thinking about the results. And the fact they're not all the same as well. I think is significant, uh, but it shows it leaves people more engaged with the place they live in. And we also again asked about skills. So we use these same sets of skills, broadly the same assessment framework, uh, partly because we wanted the data to be comparable, and partly because we knew this same activity, these one metre squares, did provide opportunities to develop these skills. And you can see here how this data is panning out, particularly this working persistently hard, being a good team member by completing your own work and helping others is coming out particularly highly. But indeed, all of these skills generally are, people are saying they feel the experience has helped them with these skills. And remember, these are transferable skills for workplace and learning. Um, and the project has run, run on. We had an exhibition uh, for being human just last month. Um, in the local shopping centre. So the dig that took place on a housing estate, we then had the exhibition, a pop-up exhibition, in the local shopping centre, in the centre of Lincoln, to attract in the sort of people that wouldn't necessarily go into a museum, uh, which was extremely successful. And we played the archaeological bingo. Um, so to summarise then, we can identify what these benefits are. And this is just a, a summary, really, and I could talk a lot about every single one of these. The enriched life experience, extended and enhanced social relationships, uh, volunteering experience for CVs, project management experience for CVs, managing your test pit dig, um, new and enhanced specific learning skills, workplace skills, life skills. And again, these are all identifiable. And then the enhanced connection with place, self-esteem. These are all changes that make real differences to real people's lives across the wide social spectrum that we've actually uh, been working on this creating more positive attitudes to people to themselves to their lives to the community they're in and raising aspirations as well so in conclusion then my question was can and should participative public archaeology tackle social disadvantage my answer would be um, with apologies to Descartes um, it can I think we have the evidence and we have a growing body of evidence for that um, that is substantive, uh, that is validated and therefore if it can do it, surely it should do it because we're actually making valuable discoveries about the past, whether it's the Black Death or whether it's social housing policies in the 1960s or any number, number of other research questions. Um, and this is precisely the sort of programme that we're going to be using in the European project that Catherine mentioned earlier. Um, we've now got funding from the European Commission, one of the last ones that we'll be able to apply for before Brexit, assuming it happens, and let's hope it doesn't, um, uh, to carry out exactly this same sort of project in rural communities in the Netherlands, the Czech Republic and Poland, all of which are countries where community archaeology is much less developed, but, but hopefully by base, being based on our experience, we can bring, uh, bring those countries up and forward and perhaps even uh, transplant some of the experience we'll gain from that back into the UK. We have a psychologist who will be working on the project as a research assistant. So, thank you very much.